do. Fly ball left field, tagging from third is Suarez. Goodell comes running in. He's under it, makes the catch. Here's the throw to the plate. It's in the air. He is. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Stupid Money Podcast. Alec here. Sean, Sean is going to be on like a, a interim, not interim, but a, a part time basis from now on. He's been busy with work and some other things, so I'm going to keep going every week. He's going to pop on. He'll probably be on next week uh, when some trade stuff occurs because I'm sure he'll want to rant about that. So for the time being, I'm just going with guests for now uh alex will probably be on maybe a couple more times got a good guest today but really quick just go through uh six games since the all-star break two and four not great uh the cubs series was bad got swept by the cubs that that can't happen at home the the brave series was nice uh taking two out of three stop hit big home run game one gave them the lead in the eighth they, they didn't play good on them uh when i was that wednesday no wednesday night and oh no sorry tuesday night and then Today, which is Wednesday, they uh, played pretty well, won seven to two. So, for it, yeah, fifty one and forty seven right now, they're tied for the last wild card spot. I the Cardinals were up last time I checked, so they'd fall a game, a half game back if the Cardinals win. Four game set with, at Pittsburgh up next. So we're gonna see what happens. Trade deadline. It's on August 2nd, only a couple days away. They got to make a couple moves. They need probably two, a starting pitcher or two, maybe another bullpen arm. I don't, there's these fake MLB leak accounts keep talking about Xander Bogarts. I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen with Segura coming back. That seems kind of confusing. Uh, Jason Stark was on 97.5, the Fanatic today. So they're saying no on Abel, Painter, Ohapi, Ben Brown. So they're, they're not really giving teams a lot to work with in terms of trade. I guess Rojas, they're okay to dangle. So we'll see what happens. Anyway, I am joined by the former Reading Bat Boy, Tyler Wackley, my, my good friend from high school. Tyler, what's up? How's it going, Alit? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. I, I, I knew eventually I had to get you on. Uh, I, was waiting, much... I was waiting for you to ask me. I, I know. I was ready to spill my expertise to the world. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you were I, you don't still work anything with writing, right? You're kind of done there now. No, no, yeah. Since I uh, late when I was in uh, towards the end of my college career, I I stopped uh, right. stopped doing that to focus more on you know my full time career moving forward. But I did it for I think uh, eight or nine years um, by the time yeah. I was done because I did it since I was before high school. I was about mm-hmm. so I was there for quite some time. Yeah, so just like, how, how did you get that job? What I know you've told me this story, and it's kind of funny, but I just for anyone out there, it was kind of a funny story how you got that job. Yeah, so we used to go, uh, my family and I, uh, from the time I was little, the time I can remember, uh, we'd go to the Reading Phillies uh, baseball games. You know, we only lived about, I don't know, 45 minutes from there uh, at the time. So we'd go all the time, uh, be there, you know, most of the home games by the end of it. Uh, and they needed a bat boy one season. So they said, Hey, like, you know, we, we notice you're here a lot, you know, you're like the perfect age to do this. Uh, would you want to be a bat boy? And that was in like, I was in like seventh or eighth grade. So, you know, it was like, you know, like what's better than that. I was in, I still love baseball to this day. I loved baseball back then. So I was like, yeah, I can't imagine, you know, coming to all these games and getting paid to do it. That sounds perfect for me. So, you know, I started, started around then they just needed somebody and I, I kind of fell into the, uh, fell into the role and the rest was history. Yeah, that's awesome. So I mean, I, I, that in in the minors, it's not just doing the bat boy stuff. There's a lot of other jobs you had to do. So what were some of them? What were some of the the cool things to come out of them? I know you've told me a couple of funny stories, but I, I know there was a lot more than just kind of grabbing bats after at bats that went into that. Yeah, absolutely. So they were. I mean, they were long days. So I was a bat boy, a bat boy for a while. Um, in there for um, I don't know. I want to say about four or five years and then I kind of transitioned more to just being a clubby so that's kind of what you refer to when you say the other stuff so anything you can think of that needs to get done around a baseball clubhouse vacuuming 
you know, washing clothes, uh, taking trash out, anything the guys need, uh, we would basically be there to provide for them, you know, making sure beer is stocked up for after games, all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, so there was um, pretty much anything you could think of that had to get done would get done. And the same was true with the umpires. Uh, so being on the home side, we would take care of the Reading Phillies as well as uh, the umpires. So I got to meet, in addition to a lot of cool players, a lot of cool umpires along the way as well. That's cool. That's cool. So, yeah. So what obviously players rehab down in the minors in Reading too. What, who are kind of like the most notable players you kind of interacted with while you were the, there? The most notable player I ever met was Alex Rodriguez. Uh, when he was okay, coming, wow. when he was coming back from, you know, his whole steroid thing, he was trying to come back. Uh, he played a couple of rehab games with Trenton. Uh, so I got to meet him, which is pretty cool. Uh, but other than him, I actually, I met, uh, Bryce Harper, when he was coming up with the Harrisburg Senators, he was like 17 or 18 at the time. Uh, I had a full, full, full bore conversation with him. Uh, so that was, that was pretty cool for me at the time. Uh, Chase Utley rehabbed there one time. So I met him. Uh, everybody's favorite, Abdul Herrera. Uh, he, he rehabbed down there. I met him. Uh, those are some of the bigger names. If I had to say, actually, I was thinking about this when you asked me to come on here. Uh, one of the coolest guys I ended up meeting was actually uh, Jerome Williams. And you okay. know that. Uh, he, he was uh, he was kind of a like a journeyman trying to make his way up for a while between AAA and the majors. Uh, it didn't work out for him at first, so he went and played independent ball uh, for a couple of years, and he was like the first independent league success story. He managed to crawl back up to the majors, uh, but he was with the Phillies for a little bit, and he ended up getting hurt, so he came down to rehab, uh, and he actually ended up playing paying all of the guys' dues while he was there. Yeah. Uh, so basically, you know, in the minors, and I'm assuming in the majors as well. Players have like a twelve, thirteen dollars a day that they have to pay for all the services that they get. Like I said, food, laundry, right. all that stuff. Um, so most guys, when they rehab, they at least buy the team a good dinner one night. Uh, he bought the team dinner every night and then paid for all their dues, cut a check for like five thousand dollars or something by the end of it. So that was uh, it was really cool. Uh, a lot of those guys that come down, uh, they recognize the grind. You know, they see that these guys are just working really hard trying to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they try to pay it forward as much as they can. But I met met quite a few cool guys down there, uh, some much lesser known and other guys uh, a little bit more known. So. Yeah, so you were down there when people were excited about the Phillies farm system because you were there in 2016, right, when they, they made the deep run in the playoffs. Yeah. Everyone was excited. Uh, they had J.P. Crawford, Nick Williams, yep. Alfaro. Yep. I mean, I, what was it like being around a playoff run like that and kind of people thinking – you know, that was the future of the team when in reality, none of those guys are here right now, but it, yep. just kind of being there for that. Yeah, that was, it was, it was honestly really cool. Um, especially being a little bit younger at the time, you need to see, uh, right. it's funny you say that. I think the only guy from that team that's still there is Zach Eflin. I know he was there okay. yeah. um, at the time. I want to say he's the only one that's still on the team. Uh, but I mean, it got to the point where when we were in the playoffs, so the clubhouse and they're redoing it all now because they have to meet those certain requirements and stuff right. for the next year. I mean, it was a small space in Reading. We're talking yeah. like real thin, not not a whole lot of room. Uh, so every time that they would clinch something, right, advance to the next round of playoffs, clinch the playoffs, we would have to tarp off all the lockers and the ceiling. And then uh, my boss would go out and get, you know, a whole shit ton of beer and champagne and stuff, and they'd spray it. We did that about four or five times that year, uh, <laughs> which was which was really cool. That was fun. Uh, when they clinched to go into the playoffs, it was Ben Lively, actually put on a full wetsuit and ran out into the pool. Uh, so that was cool. And that team was managed by Dusty Wathen. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Now. So that was, it was cool though. It was cool to see. You wouldn't think that guys get, you know, I guess people kind of think of minor leagues. as It's just a, uh, it's just a stepping stone, which is true. Right. Uh, but those guys got, you know, genuinely excited to be going as far as they were. So that was really cool to see. They, they love to win at every level, right? They're competitive athletes. Even at the double A level, they love to win. Uh, not just up in the majors. So that was probably yeah. the coolest, the, one of the coolest years of my life there. Yeah. I think honestly, what you said about them actually caring about winning there, that's kind of been the knock on the Phillies right now is that they brought in a bunch of guys from different teams that, that didn't come up together and win together. Like you look at the the Braves, all those guys are kind of around the same age. They all came up through the minors together, won together in the minors and, you know, won a world series based that way. So I, I think the point about, winning is definitely important because we've kind of seen the opposite here. Yeah, no, you're, you're definitely correct. Um, it's, it's cool to see guys grow. And I mean, people don't always think about baseball as being a, a team sport, but right. it really, it really is. I mean, I didn't play past high school, but 
I can tell you even from playing in high school, uh, if you don't have a good chemistry in the locker room with your teammates, you know, it's going to transition poorly onto the field. And the true, that's true, you know, through the minors and into the majors. So I think there's a lot to be said for teams that can grow and develop. And I mean, you know, as well as anybody, the Phillies farm system hasn't been the best at doing that, you know, through the past couple of years, they've been, uh, been faltering a little bit. So hopefully they can turn that around here shortly. Yeah. You were also there when Reese Hoskins and Dylan cousins had the smash bros thing going. What it was like being there with that small ballpark in Reading? Those guys, I think they both had almost 40 home runs that year, both drove in 110 plus. I mean, what was the vibe like around those guys when that was going on? Yeah, it was, it was crazy. That was another good year. Um, yeah. and I remember at the same time there was a closer, um, his name was Justin friend and he was going for like the save record at the same time that the two of them were going for the home run record. Uh, it's funny the guys actually used to make fun of them because the ballpark's so small. Yeah. That's the left field that just carries. So like Dusty would always make fun of them. Like, Oh, you guys couldn't do this at a real ballpark. And they're, you know, their numbers were always, were always inflated at home, which was funny, but they were, yeah. again, uh, they were both super, uh, super into that it wasn't just like oh whatever you know we're just doing this they were they were mm -hmm. both excited about it you could tell it was a little competition <laughs> with them as to you know who could get more home runs so that was cool to see that's cool um you know then like reese goes off has a pretty decent mlb career and then another guy who we talked about recently that you knew was Derek hall when you see these guys kind of go up in the majors and actually succeed like how cool is that like for you that you're like, no, I'm like face to face with these guys every day, like picking up their bats and stuff. And then the next day, like they're in the majors, like, you know, what, what do you think about that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's cool because, you know, you see these guys on TV and they're like, they're larger than life figures, right? Right. You, know, you see them and you're like, oh, like Chase Utley, for example, or somebody like that. You're like, oh my God, like these guys are famous. I like, I can't even imagine. I get to form, I don't want to say form a more personal bond with them, but mm -hmm. you, know, you get to see how they are as people. Because what it boils down to is they're just people like you or I. And right. I'm going to say 99 out of the 100 guys that you meet are really good dudes. You know, they're all they're all good guys. They're all friendly. They're all nice. They all want to help you out. And they're all, like Derek Hall is the perfect example. I was telling you the other day. Mm -hmm. Quiet, humble guy, just yeah. there trying to do his thing. <laughs> So it's cool to be able to relate that on a more personal level versus just some some famous person that you wouldn't ever talk to. Yeah. On the flip side, uh, the trade deadline is, as I mentioned, is coming up. Were you were you ever there when someone got? You don't have to name names. Were you ever there when someone got traded? And kind of what what is like the reaction like and the vibe like for him and like the clubhouse? What something like that happens? Right. Uh, I mean, I've been there when guys have got sent down, traded, called up. But uh, the one, and I, I will name drop one guy. It was Tommy Joseph, if you remember that. Okay. Well. Yeah. He was. Uh, he was traded to us from to the Phillies from the Giants, and he right. was in Richmond at the time. And Redding was in Richmond, so he just literally. Oh wow! Went, I didn't know that. Yeah, he walked from one clubhouse over uh, over to the next. Um, it's actually, I mean. That's the thing. It's kind of almost a, like a shock when these guys hear mm -hmm. stuff like that because, again, like you hear somebody get traded and you're like, oh, whatever, it's just part of it. But, you know, for these guys, it's their entire lives. You right. know, they just, you know, especially if you're kind of, if you're not, if you don't have that kind of money, if you're not, you know, a, a big league guy, that it's like your entire life just got uprooted and you need to get all your stuff packed up because you're getting on an airplane tomorrow morning and leaving. Like you have like seven hours to get your stuff together. So it's almost like a, you don't really even have time to process it. At least that's what I've noticed. It's just mm -hmm. kind of get, get my shit packed up, go back to my apartment, get it all and leave. So it's almost like a, like a surreal moment for a lot of these guys. Yeah. I, guess, I guess you try not to think about that, you know, cause you know, it could happen at any time. So you just kind of go to the field every day and grind and try not to think about, Oh, what if I get sent down or what if I get traded or something like that? And I mean, there's always bigger name guys, right? Like, you know, minor leaguer guys that are on the trading block or bigger name guys. So I guess maybe they feel it a little bit more, but I think mostly they just go and try to block it out of their heads. Yeah. I mean that it is kind of weird. Like you're drafted by a team or signed when you're 16 and then yeah. they tell you everything. You're like the only thing they know. And then, you know, you're kind of gone pretty quick. It, yeah. it is a little surreal. I can imagine that is, that is something. So Reading, Reading is known as like one, I guess like one of the goofier minor league teams in a way. I mean, what there's been some weird like promotional things that have gone on there, but to you, what, what has been like the weirdest, like that thing that they've done there? They got, 
they're doing some <laughs> kind of theme night every single night. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the – they have a Star Wars night, and a, the Harry Potter night's pretty cool. I mean, you get uh, – you know, there's some super fan, not to offend anybody out there, there's some super fan Harry Potter people, and they will show up to that ballpark decked out in Harry Potter <laughs> here with their wands, and same thing with Star Wars night. Um, I remember when I used to go to the games before I was a bad boy, they used to have a gluttony night. You could get like, uh, yeah, yeah. like a $20 wristband, and it was like all you can eat on certain stuff. That was usually pretty popular. Um, but I guess the crazy, craziest thing they do on a normal basis is the crazy hot dog vendor. That seems uh, cool. yeah. it gets people excited. That brings people into the building. They love to see that. So it's, I guess it's kind of a way of, you know, baseball is not super popular to the point where people want to go see the minor league team. You got to bring fans in somehow. So they come up with all these, you know, goofy promotions and interactions and stuff like that. Oh, I just thought of something else. Every year they do a wrestling night. Um, okay. There's one night a year, it's a wrestling night. They usually bring in like a former WWE wrestler to do an appearance. They set up a like a ring in the plaza, and they okay. usually have some kind of like I don't know, like C-rated wrestling people come out and and wrestle. And usually, I mean, I would say at least a thousand people stay afterwards to watch it. It's insane. Jeez. It's like midget wrestling at a Cigars International. <laughs> They used to have they used to have ostriches, right? Like they did, actual, yeah, for like, yeah. For like a good two years in there, they had live ostriches. They just lived in the outfield and like a little fenced in area above the thing. They just hung out there. Uh, what were their names? Ruth and uh, Ruth and Judy, I think, were their names. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, they just, they just hung out back there. They laid, they laid huge eggs all the time, like the size of my head. It was nuts. That is funny. I I know. Um... They had they had Zach Hample night back in April and he did a whole I watched the video, he did a whole video on Reading, which is cool. I don't know. People people have mixed feelings about him. I don't know. He's a little he's a little nuts, but I actually think he's he's kind of good for the game in the way that you know he he posts stuff. He when he catches a ball, most of the time he's gonna give it to a kid and stuff. I mean, yeah. he's a little wacky, but it was kind of funny watching him like walk around Reading and everyone they had like a whole day for him. That, that right. was something. Right. It's it's all about growing the game for a younger audience, I guess. It's yeah. funny you mention it because I know his big thing is, you know, batting practice. He'll sit out there and get home run balls. So something people don't think about is that, like, sure, the major league teams have like an infinite amount of money and resources to get equipment. Mm -hmm. Minor leagues aren't that way. So we had like a, you know, we had a finite number of balls that we had every single month that we could that we could use. So we had a use, we would go out there before the gates would open and pick up all the home run balls from BP to continue to reuse them until we couldn't anymore. So if I was working there when he was there, it would have been we would have had to try to oh, like, oh we need these balls, we need these BP balls. So it's a lot of that stuff is you know I don't want to say overlooked. It's not even thought of by people that right. go to the stadium, but it's it's a different environment than in a major league game. You know we need to go and get home run balls so we can reuse them and and stuff like that. So that's. It's interesting to see the the grind, if you will, from the minor leagues to the majors. Yeah, and I mean it's not it's not just the players either. It's like stuff like people that work there, like you. Like you have had three or four different tasks, whereas you know with the Phillies, there's probably three people that do one of those three yep. tasks. Like it, people kind of underappreciate to the people that make it work in the minors. I feel like. Yep. I mean, by and large, when we were, by the time I was just, you know, working as a clubby, it was pretty much me, my boss and one other guy, you know, we were just mm -hmm. doing everything. And it was, it's a lot of running around and a lot of, a lot of it, like, and you said the grind and the same is true. I always like to bring this up when I talk about, you know, working there is the umpires, you know, those guys are, you know, everybody kind of just forgets about them or looks at them like villains or something like that. Those guys are grinding as hard, if not even harder than, the players they don't have a home for the entire season right, right. they're literally living in a hotel driving around in a dodge chrysler van trying to uh trying to get their way up and they're the same way you know they could get called up at any time or they can get released at any time and no longer be a professional umpire so everyone from the players to the workers like you mentioned to the umpires are are really out there you know grinding for nothing just trying to to make it up and you know make something of it which is it's cool it's it's neat to see the yeah. guys that that really want to get there and be that person yeah so uh the past couple of years and this happened a lot during the lockout with the the player association wanting better conditions for the minor leaguers and stuff first i mean wh what do you were conditions bad that you know of for some guys like wh what are some of the craziest stories i know 
the Yankees people like to tell the story of uh, Clint Frazier living above a funeral home in like Old Forge or something. Like, so I, I don't know if you ever heard like any story like that about like a crazy experience yeah. a player had trying to live somewhere. I mean, I, there was guy. Typically, you would have like four to five guys in a two bedroom apartment. You know, you had wow. one guy sleeping on a couch, one guy sleeping on an air mattress. Um, and a lot of the problem with it was the leases, right? It's hard to get a lease for, for six, seven months at a time. Right. And then again, you never know when you're going to get called up or sent down. So it was guys, a lot of, a lot of grown men living in a, living in a room at one time. Uh, the, one of the funniest things that I recall was Ethan Martin. Uh, he, he, okay. pitched, he, he threw a few games in the bigs. Um, it was the end of the year and it was like, we, they made the playoffs. It might've been that year in 2016 that you just talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, they made the playoffs and it was like, okay, so what do we do? Do we, you know, renew our leases? Do we just kind of wait it out? So he said, screw it for like the last two or three weeks of the season. He just lived on the trainer's table in the clubhouse <laughs> because he had nowhere else to go. Oh, so it was, and it was funny because cars were another thing. So there was a lot of, a lot of guys specifically, um, you know, guys from Latin America who would fly up, didn't have a car. They would mm -hmm. buy like this, you know, a cheap beater car and like six of them would show up. You could always tell the guys that got drafted high versus the guys that didn't by the car they drove in. You know, you had these high draft picks, they're yeah. driving jacked up trucks, Jeeps, Mustangs. Then you had, you know, five guys from Latin America pulling up in a 2004 Honda Civic. So there was always, there's always that aspect of it too, you know, simple stuff like transportation that people don't think about that it's tough for some of these guys to get. Yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people understand that like some of these uh latin america guys are signed at 16 for like as little as twenty thousand dollars which oh, is yeah. you know for most people that's maybe a half a third of their annual salary yep and then you have guys who like last week in the draft the first overall pick the value is like 8.5 million or something like that so there you're handing an 18 year old almost nine million dollars i mean there there's a drastic difference sometimes between some guys and the minors and i i think that kind of pushes some guys to to work a little harder than others at times too yeah no i completely agree because i mean if you could get up to once you hit the 40-man roster you get that that minimum salary which i i know right. a couple of years ago it was like four hundred thirty-five thousand dollars. i don't know what it is now but i mean it was like if you could get yourself up to that 40-man level i mean that could be the difference for some guys, like that could be everything to them. That could be their, mm -hmm. their children are secure for life. That could mean the world to them. So I, I would completely agree that, you know, it could push guys who maybe didn't get that huge signing bonus or weren't a top draft pick to, uh, to, you know, work a little bit harder to get up to that point. Yeah. I think that's another thing that kind of that brings up between the draft and the signing thing is you have a lot of uh, unique cultures and stuff than living in you know Reading, pennsylvania in that little locker room like what's it kind of like you know there's maybe some guys don't speak english guys eating different food and stuff like kind of is there is it like are there like packs do people do they intertwine in that do they mingle like what yes they're by they're the end of the year most definitely packs and groups of people you know and it typically it would be you know, say the guys that are from a similar region, say in Latin America, are going to hang right. together. I mean, in the locker room, the way we had it set up was the two catchers were always right in the front because they got a spare locker in between them for all their gear. Mm -hmm. And then the pitchers were kind of up front, and then the fielding position player is more in the back. Uh, so you could tell that certain guys definitely uh, definitely more mingled together, and you could tell the guys that lived together had a closer, a closer type of relationship. But then another thing to consider then is some of these guys are – like some of these guys have families. So right. you'll have you'll have a, somebody that's younger than us, you know, like an 18, 19 year old there, maybe just trying to live it up. And then you got a 26 year old guy down yeah. the other end of the hallway with, you know, a wife and two kids. So it, it all depends on on the situation, I guess. It depends on, you know, where they're at in their lives. Do they need, you know, a space for themselves? Do they need, you know, an apartment? But yeah, definitely, definitely people tend to stick together. I notice mostly from different regions whether it be of the united states or of the world they'll tend to uh, gravitate towards each other yeah because i mean mo most of these baseball guys if they get drafted or signed in their teens they didn't go to college so this is kind of their first time away from home like they, they don't know what to expect and then they're kind of thrown in this locker room with 20 other guys it is it is kind of funny to think about it that way right yeah like you said you're drafted at you know your senior year of high school and yeah. then boom, you go from 
living in your living in your bedroom that you've grown up in to some place like Reading, Pennsylvania, and, and you got to somehow make it work. And it's pretty crazy. The guys ever say anything about like, wow, this area is boring or anything? like, is there like, is there kind of like the will? Do you think they put these some of these minor league places in super boring places to motivate guys to like want to get out of there and like go to the big cities? Like, <laughs> I never thought the- of it that way, but that's definitely possible. And I'll be honest with you, I think of the places that guys, at least in the Eastern League, play. Reading, Pennsylvania is probably one of the more desirable locations, if you can believe that. I mean, you have places like. Bowie, Maryland is out in the middle of nowhere, right. up in Portland, Maine. I mean, some some of these places are just in the, and then especially when you get into the Midwest, like some of these guys playing out in the Midwest, whatever league they may be in. I mean, you're talking legitimately middle of nowhere, yeah. you know, nothingness. I don't know where where they came up with some of these, but I would say, I mean, Reading, Pennsylvania comparatively is probably not a horrible place to land versus versus some of these other locations. I've no idea how they settled on some of these areas, but they are definitely like just little dots on the map, middle of nowhere. Yeah, the Phillies are kind of one of a few organizations that all their minor league locations make sense. Like right. they have one on the Jersey Shore, there's one in Reading, there's one in Lehigh Valley. Like I know it changed now, but for the longest time, the Mets AAA was in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what you do if like the morning of a mm-hmm. Sunday afternoon game, you're in New York. And your pitcher has a blister or something. You got to bring someone up from AAA, and they're you know playing out in California. Like I, I think the Phillies uh, have picked good locations compared to some other teams in the past. Yeah, I, I agree. And like I mentioned, Richmond earlier. I mean, Richmond's the Double A team for the Giants, so same kind of thing. Like you said, yeah. you, gotta, you need to call somebody up from Double A. I mean, you're talking a, a five, six hour flight to get them from Richmond, Virginia out to San Francisco. It doesn't really add up. Like you said, Philly, you're, if you're going from double A AA or triple A, you're talking maybe an hour, hour and a half drive. So it makes sense versus versus some of these other locations. Yeah. So the last question that I did want to ask you was how, how important do you think it is that MLB and each organization continues to support these guys and gives them better living conditions, you know, not make, like you said, they pay dues, like that, that goes away, stuff like that. Cause the truth is the vast majority of these guys aren't going to become, you know, Bryce Harper, Manny Machado with the $300 million contract. And most of them aren't even going to become Jerry's Familia where they get a $6 million a year thing. Like a lot of these guys are going to end up in an average job. And most of the time they're not as well off educated because they skipped college. So, like, how important do you think it is that they just keep supporting these guys and give them the cheap, like, help them get to the majors and also kind of make their living expenses a lot cheaper while they try to do that? Right. No, I mean, I think it's it's extremely important, you know. And I'm not I'm not going to sit here and say that these guys need to, you know, even be making six figures a year. But I know right. I know a lot of teams are making strides in terms of housing is the big one. Mm-hmm. You no, know, that's the big thing this year is that. Uh, MLB teams are subsidizing housing either by putting guys up in at least hotels on the MLB team's dime or renting out apartment complexes or allowing them to live in certain places where they handle the lease. I mean, just something like that is huge because I I always noticed that was the biggest thing with guys was, you know, how could we sign a a year-long lease when, one, we're only going to be here for max six months of the year, and two, we might be up and down and somewhere in between for the entirety of that six months. Uh, so I think it's really important. It, it and I think it benefits the the teams as well because if you take off that type of financial stress and burden on the guys, they're they're going to be able to perform more freely. The same is true yeah. of any job, right? That's why right. you know if you apply for a job, you know one of us applies for a job out in California or something, they might offer relocation assistance to kind of take that burden off you a little bit. The same is true with these guys. You know they need to be they need to be focusing on baseball and on perfecting their craft. And I'm not saying that means they need to all make millions of dollars, but I think it would be big strides if the teams could provide them housing and, you know, more affordable meals and probably bump up the wages a little bit too. I know guys, like you said, make, you're talking, some guys might sign for a $10,000 signing bonus and then make $10,000 for the year. So, you know, you're, you can't, it's physically impossible to live off of that. So I think the more within reason that these big league clubs can do, the better off both they'll be in the long run and of course that the uh, the guys will be as well. Yeah, I mean I mean like the Yankees are worth six billion. I, I don't see how they can't 
put up like a row of townhomes in each town where they have a minor league team. That that doesn't seem overly like you only maybe need like eight to ten of them. It's not like a whole neighborhood. So I mean, I I think there are a lot of ways to help these guys out. There's a lot of money in the game, and I, I think kind of trickling it down to the lower levels will uh, help the game too. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Like you said, with all this money that these teams have, um, it's only it's only going to help them out in the long run if they give these guys, you know, a little bit less stress trying to navigate a new city for the first time in their lives. So I think I think that'll help everybody involved. I think it's really important uh, that they keep working and that the players' commission keeps pushing the uh, the commissioner's office to keep doing this kind of stuff. So. Yeah, for sure. All right, Phillies four games in Pittsburgh before the deadline. I uh, no idea what's going to happen, what they're going to do. I, I don't know. I don't think they're going to get Ian Happ, which would be nice for center field. Bogarts, I doubt it. We'll see. Probably a couple starters. So we'll we'll have to see what happens. Sean, maybe if they get something big, we'll get some emergency trade pot out here. I do appreciate Tyler coming on. I did want to have him on for a while because I know he had a lot of fun stories. Uh, we might have to do it again. I think we will eventually. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever you want to. I'm always down to talk about my experiences. I love it. All right. <laughs> All right, so thank you for watching and listening. See ya.